Good morning, everybody. For anybody who's online, we'll be um, waiting a couple of minutes just so people can come into the room. Right, hello everyone. We thought we waited a bit longer to see if more people will turn up. <laughs> oh, I can see myself. <laughs> yeah, great to see you all here this morning. Um, could we change back to the presentation? Or? Okay, good. <laughs> um, so yeah, I would like to welcome you here to uh, Bridging Digital and a large humanitarian organization. What we'll be talking about this morning will be mapping and how this can be utilized in NGOs and in the humanitarian context. My name is Katharina Lorenz and I've got my colleague here, Lucy Price, we're from the German Red Cross. And then we've got Jeremy and Margarita from the International Federation of the Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies here with us today this morning as well. So let's start with the presentation. I'm pressing. <laughs> it worked when I tested it earlier. Yeah. <laughs> Shall I try the other one, maybe? Oh, yeah. All right. So. Maps play an important role in understanding human communities and especially when it comes to populations that are at risk. And most of the uh, developed world is mapped in high detail. <laughs> Sorry, that is confusing. <laughs> that threw me a bit now. Um, <laughs> okay. 
but yeah, so most of the developed world is mapped in high detail. But obviously, vulnerable areas and where populations are at risk, those maps are not available. Um, who of you has heard about OpenStreetMap? No? Okay, so half of the people have, half not. So let me explain OpenStreetMap to you. OpenStreetMap works um, on the same concept as Wikipedia, which you're probably all familiar with. So just that it's instead of like a lexicon, it's a map. So anyone can add to OpenStreetMap, can edit it, um, can use it for their needs, um, as long as they attribute the source as OpenStreetMap. And thus it creates a free database with data available to anyone which covers the entire world. But the problem here is that again, the focus on OpenStreetMap has been on the first world, and areas like Africa, um, Southeast Asia, um, and Latin America are poorly mapped. Therefore, the Red Cross, MSF, and the Humanitarian OpenStreetMap team have decided to create Missing Maps, which was founded five years ago. And Missing Maps basically uses the OpenStreetMap as a platform and builds on that and then maps areas in vulnerable, uh, yeah, maps areas in the world where you've got populations at risk. So how does that work now? Um, here you can um, see an example of a map that many NGOs have to work with. In this area, you've got a population of 80,000 people, and you can see if you've got a disaster or an epidemic outbreak, um, this map is very difficult to work with. You don't know anything about the connectivity, where are the population centered, um, so it's very difficult to plan a response. So in that scenario, missing maps can help you. So missing maps consists of three steps. The first step um, is what we call a mapathon, where remote volunteers come together and they then use satellite imagery or aerial imagery and use that to trace buildings, roads or rivers or even land use. And this data then automatically gets fed into OpenStreetMap. In the second step, we work together with local communities, so that can be our Red Cross volunteers um, in, in the particular country where we've got a mapping campaign. Um, and they then go out with the map that has been created in those mapathons by remote volunteers and use those maps could be in a printed form or you can put it on a mobile device uh, or tablet and they then go around the communities in small teams and add in additional information. For example, what's the name of a road? What's the building? Is it a hospital? Is it a school? Depending on the project, you might also record information about what is the uh, a structure of a building, you know, for example, if you're working in earthquake prone areas, you might want to record, you know, is this a concrete building or is it brick and so on. And then this information, those attributes get added back into OpenStreetMap when the volunteers come back from the field. And then in the third step, this information is available to all humanitarian organizations to use. So it's not just used, if, it, if it's a Red Cross campaign, it can still be used by MSF for, you know, that's, that's the good thing about using OpenStreetMap, making it open source, anyone can then use it. Here we can see an example of the first step. So you can see the satellite image and how then the buildings get traced by the volunteers. Here we've got the second step, um, where you can see the local volunteers have the mapping information on a tablet, 
and then a predefined form was built so they can then easily add the information um, that's relevant for their project. This is an example of a um, before and after a mapping campaign, which was for the Ebola response in the Democratic Republic of Congo. So you can see at the beginning, the available map on OpenStreetMap only showed you the main roads and maybe the names of the communities or settlements in the surrounding areas. But after the mapping campaign, you can see we've got a much more detailed road network, we've got individual houses now, we've got more information about place names and so on. And this um, information was gathered by, I don't know, 400 volunteers in, in very quick time, you know, it didn't take very long. Normally creating such a map in, in such a detail would take months, but because of the community effort, such maps can, build, can be built very quickly. Yeah, now I would like to hand over to my colleague Lucy, who will tell you a bit how this mapping information is then used in Red Cross projects. Exactly, thanks Katarina. So today I'm going to talk to you a bit about forecast-based financing. Is this familiar to anyone in the room? Excellent, okay. So forecast-based financing, is an approach that enables humanitarian funding for early actions based on in-depth risk analyses and impact-based mapping. And so essentially, what the goal of FBF is to anticipate disasters, prevent their impact, and reduce human suffering and losses. Please come in and have a seat. <laughs> so maybe a little bit to this funny name, forecast-based financing. What does this mean exactly? Forecast-based, as you can probably infer, this is about weather forecasts. Uh, as everyone sitting in the room, as well as joining us online, knows very well, we have incredible access to data and information nowadays, and weather forecasting continues to increase in accuracy and efficiency. So forecast-based decision-making and financing. Why financing? Traditionally, with humanitarian assistance, um, with the weather forecast, for example, we know a cyclone is approaching five to seven days. With traditional humanitarian assistance, you wait for the cyclone to make landfall, wait for the money, and then you act. With forecast-based financing, we're trying to shift and close this gap in anticipation so that we can act earlier, and we need the funds to do so. So um, the financing part comes into play because we've developed a financing mechanism hosted by IFRC. This is FBA by the draft, forecast-based action by the draft. And so we're working with national societies now to enable them to act earlier. And you can access this funding by developing what's called an early action protocol. So a list of all of the actions you want to take in, in this short window of time before that forecast and the, the impact of this disaster. Um, and with this early action protocol, it's full of roles and responsibilities, a whole plan that can be unlocked as soon as this trigger has been reached. So how do we know what early actions to include in this protocol? We know this through um, risk assessments. So step one, here you can see our, our FBF methodology on the, on the screen here. Step one, we work together with national societies, with hydro meteorological agencies, with disaster risk management authorities, communities, researchers, scientists, in order to sit down and first assess what hazards a country faces, which regions are most exposed, and who is most vulnerable. And this is where mapping becomes instrumental. Here's an overview, first of all, of FBF, just briefly. FBF started in 2014, so this is a very new, exciting project. And as you can see currently, um, now FBF is being applied to 22 countries uh, throughout the globe, and we're tackling a range of hazards, ranging from floods, cyclones, cold waves, heat waves, volcanic ash, you name it. Come in, come in. 
Have a seat. All right, so how does this look in practice? FBF in Vietnam uh, began basically in 2018. So Vietnam is one of the most disaster prone countries in the Asia Pacific region. It's also one of the most top five countries affected by climate change. With increased urbanization and climate change, heat waves pose a serious hazard, a serious public health hazard, especially to urban populations. And these pockets of heat waves create an urban heat island effect. So this acutely affects people. So the unique part about this FBF Vietnam project is that we applied FBF for the first time in an urban context. So how do you know, in a very densely populated city of 16 million people, how do you know who's most vulnerable? How do you find them? Where? And so we worked GRC together with the Vietnamese Red Cross, the IFRC, and the Climate Center, um, essentially launched a very big survey called the Knowledge Attitudes and Practices Survey and interviewed people in all 12 districts of Hanoi asking questions about heat wave sensibility. You know, do you rec how, what do you do usually for, for work? Are you outside? Um, can you recognize symptoms of heat stroke to gauge sensibility? And they combine this with mapping. So in order to tackle these questions and really figure out the impact of a heat wave, so not, not the, a heat wave itself, but the consequences of what it can do, you have to look at vulnerability. So as an outcome of this study, it was clear then that those most vulnerable are children under five years old, the elderly over 60, as well as people with chronic illnesses, diseases, and disabilities. And then they mapped exposure. So looking at who's most exposed during a heat wave phenomenon. And these are people with um, living in mostly poor housing conditions, informal housing conditions, with little to no access to air conditioning or cooling devices. And then, of course, they layered the hazard itself onto this map. So looking at urban heat island effects and taking satellite images and pinpointing using land surface temperatures these, these extreme pockets of heat within the city. And here's the outcome. So you, for an impact-based map, you take these three layers, exposure, vulnerability, and hazard, and you layer them to create this beautiful heat wave impact index we see here. So this is the result of examining 168 communes in Hanoi. And what you can see on the right-hand side are the top 15 most impacted by heat waves. And these are also signified in the dark red pockets here outlined in green. And so this last July and August, essentially, Vietnam and Hanoi in particular experienced some very hot, very humid days. And so the trigger was set at um, a threshold level of three consecutive days exceeding 37 degrees Celsius with extremely high humidity levels. And using open street maps um, and, and this impact-based map, they were the the Vietnamese Red Cross was immediately able to then target those most vulnerable pockets of the city and open up cooling centers, as well as have mobile cooling buses to provide first aid, water, uh, and resting opportunities for, for over 3,000 visitors. And this is just a simulation. So the Vietnamese Red Cross, they're continuing <coughs> to fine tune their early actions uh, for their early action protocol. And so this will also expand then um, to further measures, for example, to um, address shelter retrofits in these cases. So that's just one example of how the German Red Cross, IFRC, and Climate Center, and all of our national societies are using the power of, of open street mapping and missing maps in order to better assist those most vulnerable. Now I'll hand this over to my colleagues, the IFRC, could give a little introduction in terms of how you're 
applying OSM missing maps to your work. Hello everyone, thank you for the introduction. My name is Margarita and I work uh, in the National Society Development Department at the Secretariat in Geneva. I'm here to share some of the things or the projects that we are doing in terms of data literacy. How to improve data literacy skills in our volunteers. We believe that it's important for them to also have the skills and the competencies necessary to use all this new technology. And we are working really hard on that. The data literacy program started three years ago with Heather Leeson. She's our data literacy coordinator. And she has been uh, putting into place a series of strategies and projects. One of them is using e-learning to help um, to support our volunteers to get more competencies in terms of data literacy. And right now we are working with Microsoft in developing a program called Excel Around the World. And basically what we did is that we created e-learning courses to help our volunteers uh, to improve their skills using Excel. So through this e-learning course that is available right now in English, French, and Spanish, volunteers can freely uh, online uh, register go to the content and after the course they are they will be able to get the Microsoft certification in Excel so we believe that these are skills are really useful and they can go back to their communities and help uh, their national society to develop uh, volunteers databases continue working on data collection projects so De definitely having these skills will improve the work that they do in the community for emergency response. Right now we have at least 200 volunteers taking this online course and we are excited and hoping that for next year we will have the capability to uh, uh, have more volunteers taking the course in other languages because we actually we want to make sure that we reach out to the different uh, countries and even in local languages that they will have the material and the content necessary to develop their skills. Another project in which I have been working uh, closely with Heather is an uh, introductory course about data literacy for volunteers. This is going to be launched uh, this month actually and we are some of the topics what, that we are covering in this e-learning course is uh, introduction to data literacy why data literacy matters to our volunteers, uh, data analysis, tools for data collection, data visualization, and most importantly, how to use data for decision making. So we are very excited about this, um, this course that we are doing actually in coordination with also Microsoft and 510. And um, it will be launched in different languages as well. And uh, the idea is that we continue developing competencies and skills uh, so volunteers can be more data literacy and support their national societies and the work they do in their communities. So these are some of the activities that we are doing and hopefully we will continue to help our national societies to become more, more data literacy and improve uh, digital transformation around the world. Now I will pass the word to uh, Jeremy. Hello everyone, Jeremy Mortimer. Um, I also work in the National Society Development Unit in um, Geneva uh, with Margarita. And my particular area of focus is uh, core institutional ICT capacities in our national societies. So we're getting progressively more general and I'll, I'll, I, I don't have all that much to add uh, in this context, but we'll come back to um, mapping in a minute. Um, <clears throat> I would just observe that in an international network with um, approaching 14 million volunteers in 190 odd countries in the world, uh, very much of the work that we do is in um, reasonably highly resourced or medium resourced contexts um, where there is good connectivity, where our volunteers all have mobile phones. But there are nonetheless um, many countries in the world where we also work 
and where um, uh, in some cases communities are particularly vulnerable, particularly, um, uh, particularly vulnerable to natural disasters, for example, where access to technology and connectivity is very, very limited. And um, that may also go for the national societies in those countries. Um, there are problems of connectivity, there are problems of resources, there are problems of skills, and uh, this is the area that I look at. In the context of mapping, um, the fact that the International Red Cross Red Crescent Movement is a volunteer-based organization uh, it gets an, uh, a new focus because areas of vulnerability, even if they're not connected themselves, can be mapped by people no matter, no matter where they are in the world. And that is the, um, uh, an essential feature of missing maps. If you have flooding in Malawi, for example, and it's affecting an area which is not, not well represented um, in open street maps, those gaps can be filled in very rapidly, and it doesn't have to be done by the local communities. Um, it can be done by anybody with access to the internet who can, um, who can see the aerial imaging and who can fill in those maps. And that gives you a base map that, you can, that, that people responding to a disaster can start with. And it doesn't have to be done by the community. Um, <clears throat> it is then accessible to the community to the extent that they have access, but it's... Uh, uh, a new approach to volunteering where um, certainly our volunteers are very local. Um, Red Cross, Red Cross volunteers come from the communities that they serve, but also volunteers from anywhere in the world can help those communities too. Great. Thank you, Margarita and Jeremy. Um, we now, I mean, we have only got an hour for our session, so we can't show you a mapathon, but we thought we introduce you to a tool called MapSwipe that anyone can use on their phone. Um, so MapSwipe is a tool that was developed by the British Red Cross and the Heidelberg Institute for Geoinformation Technology. And it's basically a, a step before missing maps. What it does is um, it loads satellite imagery on your phone, in the app, and then people just look at it and the first step just say, okay, in this task I'm looking for buildings or I'm looking for roads, and then you just tip. If you see a road, you mark it in the satellite image and then you swipe and you look at the next picture and so on. And this basically filters the data. I can show you here in this diagram. So instead of putting like a massive area onto the tasking manager, which is used for missing maps, um, you already filter out those areas where you know for sure that there are no buildings and, or there are no roads or any other infrastructure. So then your missing maps campaign is much more efficient and the volunteers and the remote volunteers just spend their time digitizing instead of having to look through, oh, where are actually those features that we are interested in. So I now would like to invite you to use your phone, go on the App Store or the, what the equivalent is for iPhone. <laughs> App oh, that's the App Store, Google Play and App Store, yeah. And just look for MapSwipe and download the app. Uh, no, just the next 10 minutes. Unless you want it to. <laughs> so once you've downloaded it, you then need to sign up.
<laughs> so has everyone managed to download it and sign up for it? Great. Then I'm just going to run you through it and then you get a chance to play with it as well yourself. So, just go back. On the main screen, you then have different missions where all the partner organizations from Missing Maps can uh, deploy their projects that they would like volunteers to look at. And once you've selected a project, you see it on the screen a satellite image and it's always split into six pieces. And those six pieces, in this example, we are looking for buildings. You then just tell the app whether you can see a building or not. If you press, if you're not really certain what you can see, you can enlarge one of those six pieces by just clicking on it for a longer period and you can see in the second screenshot how this then pops up. Now, what do you do when you see a building? When you, when you see a building on one of those six squares, you just tap once and it marks that, uh, yeah, that piece with a green color, which then indicates there is a building there. And then you just swipe and you get to the next screen. Sometimes you might be unsure whether what you're seeing is actually a building. So you can see here on the second um, piece on the left, I wasn't sure whether it was a building. So you can then tap twice and you can see the color changes to orange. And that means there might be something there, but you're not quite sure what it is. And then obviously you can come across imagery where there's cloud cover, in which case you tap three times and it marks those areas with a red color and that then tells the system there's cloud cover here and we actually can't tell what's underneath it. Um, so yeah, now I would all like to invite you to have a play with it and yeah, discover it for yourself. And that's always, you know, something people can do while you're waiting on the bus stop or, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, if people have got any questions while they are swiping, please ask. <laughs> So it's it's a, a question, maybe not less less on the maps, but <laughs> so my name is um, Angela uh, Angela Kastner. I'm from the Digital Impact Alliance. So we are a program that sits with the UN Foundation. Um, and one of the areas uh, where I'm looking at in particular is the procurement and financing of digital. And that's why I'm very interested in this financing model you mentioned and. I believe the Red Cross has been quite innovative in some of the approaches you've taken because, of course, the, the donors will quite often drive what you can and can't do. So, so a, a couple of questions. Could, can you tell me a little bit more? So, so you have your forecast-based funding program, which I think is excellent because it gives you the money <laughs> when you need it. Um, but how, how is there other particular donors behind that? Because quite often their funding will be 
earmarked for particular things and, and if you, you then come with something that maybe falls a bit outside that it's, I think, difficult for the donors to manage that internally or their, their own structures might not allow them to react as quickly. Um, and, and then the, my second question is, uh, I'm interested, you, you have Medicine Sun Frontier, Red Cross, you, you've, you, it seems like you've, for this program, been able to pull together a nice collaboration and coalition and have you any tips on how, how you approached that or how you did that? Because it's obviously, I think, more impactful because you have more entities working on it. So any lessons learned from how you've set that up or established that, or, or was it just through you started it and others came and were interested? Um, I will maybe then just first answer the question regarding the financing mechanism. So this is still donor driven. Um, this is basically, I don't know if you're familiar with the DREF. The DREF is the Disaster Relief Emergency Fund. Um, and so classically, I mean, this is um, instrumental in the case of a disaster, you, write, you submit an appeal to IFRC and this DREF is unlocked essentially. Um, and now we have a whole segment, a, a new segment of the draft, FBA, forecast-based action by the draft, which is specifically set aside for anticipation, so for these early actions. Um, and they're not, these are, I mean, it's quite flexible, per se, so, and that's because of the early action protocol. Um, and, and this is driven by national societies, by communities, by all of the organizations we work with in the process of, of formulating this protocol. Um, and so this is something chosen by them with a series of early actions, roles and responsibilities, budget. Um, there's also funding specifically for preparedness and readiness, as well as the activation costs. And um, each early action protocol, this funding, once it's approved by the validation committee in Geneva, this funding is basically guaranteed for five years uh, because the trigger might not be reached within a year or two. Um, so it's, it's guaranteed for five years, set aside for all 191 national societies that submit an EAP uh, that have that approved. Okay, I'll take uh, your second question. I think using open source tools, you know, open data always helps. I mean, Missing Maps was founded by four organizations, and now after five years, it has grown to 18. And yeah, given that the approach was, you know, from the start very collaboratively, you know, it just made it very easy. But obviously we do have our problems as well, which is funding, you know, um, funding development of software tools is not as sexy as, you know, providing disaster relief, you know, so um, we do have problems there. But um, the, you know, the working together, you know, and how all the different um, organizations are using it or maybe even using it in the in same countries in similar areas, you know, that, that tends to be fairly easy, you know, than the way the different actors can talk to each other and, and liaise between each other in the different mapping campaigns. Yeah? My name is Horst Kremers. I'm information scientist and uh, I um, work with um, disaster risk reduction organizations, national, European and uh, with UNDRR. Um, and um, I, I appreciate very much this, this free and open crowdsourcing geo-information that, that you do. Uh, nevertheless, I have the impression, especially since we are here on the United Nations conference, uh, one should at least mention the framework of the other very long-standing and very important also for these management tasks of, of uh, first uh, um, assistance 
uh, disaster preparation and, and so on. Um, I just want to mention a few because some of the, the colleagues sitting here may not have, may have the impression that all our assistance in disaster depends on crowdsourced information. Sorry, it, it's, it's just a remark. I know the Heidelberg people <laughs> that are working with you and developing these things. Sometimes I see a tendency that they say it's only this crowdsourcing information. It's not. And just let me tell uh, very shortly, uh, uh, other organizations like uh, UN Spider, uh, that is a space-based information system of remote sensing data, which nowadays goes down to 20 centimeter resolution on ground, and I tell you it's very helpful to have this. Then there is, for the disaster case, there is an international charter on space and major disasters, which uh, there are space agencies put together, which in the case of disaster, within six hours, they come up with rapid mapping, so-called rapid, rapid mapping products, which exactly is assist the strategic first decisions on how to get the finance and, and how to help. How large is the disaster in monetary aspect to send uh, rescues, uh, rescue troops to send assistance, food, and whatsoever. So this is certainly not based on crowdsourced information, uh, and this is based on long years of negotiation to do exactly this, as adequate as these funding organizations, the World Bank, the, the real big people that uh, give the money uh, do. And then we have, on the professional side, I just recommend to look at the International Cartographic Association, uh, which uh, also uh, has a lot of uh, even commissions on, on disaster. And uh, then for free and open, you should mention this remote sensing data you're uh, dealing with. Uh, most of it nowadays in Europe comes from the Copernicus system. And uh, this is free and open even for, for other uh, non-European countries. And uh, this, that would be a, a, a basis for this. Now, um, I think we should have joined to join forces because to make sure, yes, where is exactly the positive, additional, very helpful add-on that crowdsourced information can get, that remote sensing cannot get? And that is, that is certainly a, a very good point, and, and I appreciate it very much. But please put it in the larger framework, because it's important to spread out the news. Yes, humanity is not only dependent on crowdsourced information. <laughs> Um, you're absolutely right about that. You'll have noticed that the, um, um, the missing maps project depends on aerial imagery, uh, and the aerial imagery is certainly not crowdsourced. Uh, where the missing maps project and crowdsourcing adds value is that it, it enables the humanitarian community and volunteers connected to the humanitarian community to fill in gaps very quickly where there's a, um, an immediate humanitarian need. I suppose it's, it's conceivable that um, that level of mapping down to the building level, in, particularly in rural communities, uh, might fairly rapidly be done by artificial intelligence tools, but for the time being, um, the contribution of a group of volunteers rapidly filling in a map where there's a humanitarian need is uh, very important. And to go one step further, um, one of the most impressive bits of mapping which has been filled in like this is the um, slum of Kibera in Nairobi. Kibera. Um, Kibera in Nairobi. Um, a slum of... Um, well, it's maybe a quarter to half a million people um, in an area of little more than a square kilometre, um, which is mapped down to the level of individual small buildings together with um, the location of resources such as health centres and um, connectivity centres and things like that, which has all been done by volunteer mapping. So, uh, yes, this couldn't happen without the... Um, without 
major investment by international agencies, by corporate entities, etc. But the, um, the added value of missing maps is that it fills in precisely where there's a humanitarian need and where, and where the uh, more formal mechanisms tend sometimes to leave gaps. Thank you, Mr. Kramer. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, we now would like to use the last quarter of an hour to put questions to you. If we could switch back to the presentation, please. Do you want to? Oh. So we've prepared three questions, and I mean, we are not that many people, but maybe we could form three teams or three groups or that. Maybe Everyone can just contribute yeah. from where or, you're seated. Or, or maybe we, we can just have an open discussion. It's maybe best. Um, yeah. So the first question is, how could OpenStreetMap and Missing Maps support your work? And then how could your organization support OpenStreetMap and Missing Maps? And the last one, what partnerships could be applied to scale OpenStreetMap and Missing Maps? So we really would welcome your thoughts on this and you're all invited to contribute to this discussion. Um, I, I, I don't know how concrete this is, but the, there is a lot of discussion at the moment within the UN and the, the high-level panel on digital cooperation around digital public goods. And this, I think, in essence, is a digital public good. Um, it, it may add on to other existing materials, but, but it's a digital. So, so one of the possible areas to look at, I think, and, and this is where UNICEF and the ITU, I don't know if you know ITU, the International, yeah. So, so they together are starting a project uh, looking at um, digital public goods, making them available, how to access them, um, my own organization, Dial, we also have a almost catalog of, of existing open source digital public goods. So those may be entities to think about or talk to or if you consider this as a digital public good that it becomes recognized as such formally and gets into that realm. Um, I personally see the, um, the strategic task. You see, we are here in a strategic conference, internet governance. So we would be happy with something like asking for, for, for uh, a kind of cooperation is one of part of the strategy. Nevertheless, from the information, general information point of view, I think one also should address this. It's not only the geo-information, but as you said, in one example of the financial aspects, there are other domains where you need a lot of socio-demographic data. So to do something, to, to make really decision-making, to put that into decision-making, you would need typically a lot of other data uh, for certain courses. There's a lot of discussion in, in details all this, all since in several years, and the, the UN DRR Sendai framework text directly lists what is necessary, also in the geo-information field. It's very specific and it's very interesting. I recommend to everyone to, to look in the text of the UN Sendai framework. The, um, the question for me is how to, to start working on this, I uh, say it would be necessary to find some test beds, like having some disaster, like in Haiti, in New Orleans, in whatsoever, take one disaster and try to put those data that are available in something like a test bed where other colleagues can try to recap the kind of what happened, what has been decided, and what has been done, and what was wrong or not. So this is a larger framework. Nevertheless, geo-information, uh, which is also not official one, would be very important to go in this, 
to for for what is also required in in several UN framework that is um, accountability. So geo information and accountability that will be something where I say yes, uh, it, it it would be some some strategic point where we say uh, how can it assist? Where are those cases where we have documentation? And I tell you. It's an agreement generally in our communities that we don't have a single idea how to document. Yeah, where do you put where you do put where do you put the results? Not just in open street map, but the use of it for certain analysis in a disaster, where is that documented for later phases to to to, to go back to this time of what was the decision on, on what data was the decision made for financing? Because also in financing there is a lot of things that go wrong. And the, the question is, and society would be interested um, to, 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 to see on, on what type of information was that decision for financing made. That is accountability. And, and that would be something that, that we are really would appreciate very much. And all the several UN frameworks texts now require accountability. I think that's a very good point to the extent that um, humanitarian response is increasingly based on data sets um, rather than a sort of rule of thumb or a, uh, an assessment written on paper. Those data, data sets continue to exist after the emergency room when we have time to look back and see um, what happened in real time during the emergency and what we did about it. Um, there is a considerable and growing amount of sharing of data sets, for example, on humanitarian data exchange. Um, and I know that some National Red Cross and Red Crescent societies are already sharing certain data sets there. Um, for the moment, it's, I think it's mostly persistent information. It's things like location of branch offices and things, and things like that, mapping information. But um, <clears throat> these data sets don't go away. And the, da the data sets even generated rapidly during the emergency response. They don't go away either. So I think you're, you're absolutely right. We can, at, at a later stage, go back and, and see what did we do? Was it the best thing we could have done? Um, what other approaches, if we'd thought of it at the time, would the existence of, of that data have offered us? So yes, I, I completely agree. Possibly not the thing to think about while you're in the middle of an emergency response, but um, but the fact that the data sets are still there is very powerful. Over there, there is, I see Habitat. Is that UN Habitat you're working with? Because that, that would be totally interesting, you see, because we are, missing, <laughs> we are missing these links also between even Red Cross and Habitat and DRR and, and, the, and the Habitat program. Um, so it is actually related to the um, Habitat summits that UN is organizing every 20 years. And I'm working for them, so it's a nonprofit based in Istanbul, Turkey. Um, however, the um, topics that we cover or our projects are um, not really, really related to this. But um, since it's also including digitalization of a nonprofit or like a um, humanitarian organization, I was interested uh, in how it's working, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we are looking for, for urban heat waves. Yeah, this is a big topic or something, or, or flooding, urban flooding, or urban sustainable development and in general. Yeah? And all these, these UN sub-organizations, they work, they work obviously sometimes in parallel. I see these topics should be somehow at least communicated to, to upwards in United Nations uh, uh, that we have to have to uh, look what is what the United Nations themselves call coherence. So if SDG and habitat uh, that is one of just for 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 an ex example that is one of my best uh, convincing <laughs> argument is. Uh, so we cannot work without coordination with, with Habitat and that coherence, you see there is a management principle that the United Nations also 
uh, accountability and coherence. It has new buzzwords, but when you see what is the practical aspect of these buzzwords, you exactly come to, to how to join forces for exactly knowing what is happening in big mega cities, in smaller cities, and how there is, there is uh, uh, resilience. Uh, to, to be supported and, and all these things. And of course, geoinformation is absolutely right with that. But uh, since we do not have all the locations of all the actors and all the resources that we have in, in urban domain, then we have to, to make joint forces that what habitat needs also should be available and be coordinated in the same way and not do it in parallel, please. Again, publication of data sets makes this collaboration much easier because you don't even necessarily need to know that a potential partner organization exists until you find the, a, a, a data set which contributes something to um, the work or analysis that you're doing in a particular area. So, you know, if Habitat publishes a data set on a particular area which I'm interested in and doing either current or retrospective work on, and I find that data set, then I know that Habitat are working there too and are contributing to, to building a better overview of the situation, which will help us as well. Uh, yes, hello, good morning. Uh, sorry for coming late. My name is Simon from GIZ. Uh, I'm not from this field of uh, GIS or um, geographical information system, more from the security part. But we recently launched or started uh, working on a strategic uh, assessment of uh, digital tools that could be used in our environment. And we work in different topics. Uh, and it's called uh, Tech Detector. And uh, I could put you in contact with our colleagues that work on this, because it might be interesting to include your tool um, in exchange with them. So it's an open. Uh, tool for everybody, but especially also for our surrounding to see that people, whatever their um, issue is, to check whether this could, um, if they find some tech solution that might fit. And um, uh, yeah, we also are constantly looking for partners that to step in. So it's called Tech Detector, and I'll, I'll give you, I'll put you in contact if you're interested. Just thanks everyone for your contribution. We are nearly at the end of our session now. So I don't know if there are any more questions from the audience. Yes? Um, I was actually looking through your um, website while this whole discussion was going on. And I was um, trying to find out about what countries or regions are a part of this project. Because um, I'm not sure if like Turkey is a part of it. Because if it's not, maybe. Um, when I go back, I can look some maybe some ways to also be a part of it. Thanks. Do you mean now the missing maps website? Uh, yeah, the whole um, application of missing maps. Yeah. So missing maps is a community of several organizations. So you've got loads of uh, Red Cross societies. Um, you've got MSF, but then you've also got research organizations like the Highgate. Um, You've got other humanitarian actors like how to ng or Map Action, and anyone is free to join. So if there is, you know, a particular organisation in Turkey you could think of that would be, you know, suitable um, and that has uh, interest and and would benefit from using those data, they could then, you know, approach Missing Maps and seek to join them, or you could also approach the humanitarian Open Street Map team. So if Turkey works in areas which aren't particularly mapped to a high detail, they could also just maybe try out and um, collaborate with HOT and work on a task um, to see if it you know, would actually benefit them. Or yeah. I think one, one organization in Turkey which obviously might be interested is Kizile, the uh, Turkish Red Crescent. Um, I, as far as I know, nobody from uh, Turkish Red Crescent is here, but uh, we could certainly ensure that, that they know about this. And obviously, I mean, they, they're very technically sophisticated. I'm sure they will be able to organize um, mapathons and things themselves if they wanted to. Yeah, I, w I would just briefly like to respond to your earlier point and agree with you. 
coherence, accountability, collaboration, and the support and linking to the global frameworks like the SDGs and Sendai are of course key to continuing to really move as a movement, not only within the Red Cross, Red Crescent, but beyond that with all of our partners doing such amazing work, and you listed so many. The wealth and breadth of initiatives and action is really impressive. Um, and this FBF presentation was just a short glimpse into what we do, and I didn't get to really address the point in which this is a movement beyond Red Cross, Red Crescent. We work very closely with partners like uh, World Food Program, with FAO, with START Network, and this has been a joint initiative so that it is not just a siloed process. And of course, FBF, it links to preparedness and response. And so these linkages ensure that we are continuing to enhance collaboration and coordination in an evidence-based way. And mapping and, and the collection and aggregation of data is what's helping us to really make sure and prove this accountability at the end and say, this is, this is why we chose to act in this way. Um, so I agree with you, and I just wanted to add a bit um, and thank everyone for joining and for the discussions. Katerina? Yeah, thanks everyone for coming here this morning. It's already been a very long week for all of you, certainly. So it's great to see you here this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you.